Alrighty, so we are continuing our study as we have spent some time now looking and um, easing into uh, the prophets and a study of the prophets. Uh, we've spent some time looking initially at some uh, introductory material, uh, looking at the prophets in general, and then we started to get into Isaiah specifically, and we'll continue that study this morning. And uh, this is, I think, very helpful that we are coinciding these studies uh, with, and it's by accident, it's just by coincidence, with where we are in our sermon material as we're looking at the question, is the Bible God's word? Uh, as we are looking at these prophecies concerning various nations and so forth, um, it, is, it is fascinating and it's also complex and can be challenging. And so it's good that we are where we are because I think that helps in regards to what we're studying for our sermon material. So let's just talk a little bit about um, Isaiah in particular, but before we do, just high level, um, the, the value of what we're doing and where this fits as we look at these prophets um, in, in terms of the overarching study of the Old Testament and what we gain from studying the Old Testament. I remember what Paul told the Romans in Romans chapter 15 and in verse 4. He writes there, for whatever things were written before, written for our learning, that we through the patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Uh, we are able to grow in our understanding of God. We're able to grow in our understanding of the way in which he works. Uh, we're able to grow in our understanding of the way in which he deals with sin, the way in which he deals with the wicked, uh, the way in which his, his justice is executed and carried out. As we study the Old Testament, we're also able to gain an understanding of his mercy and of his graciousness uh, concerning mankind as ultimately his promises are fulfilled throughout uh, the fluctuating uh, powers and ebbs and flows of governments and of uh, world powers. And so um, this is an extremely valuable study looking at the Old Testament. Uh, we are, gro are growing in our wisdom and in our appreciation uh, and our, our reverence for, for God. Uh, think about what Paul tells Timothy, as we've looked at just about every class, 2 Timothy chapter 3, and verse 15, and that from childhood you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. And you think about again, and I don't think we can emphasize this enough, um, you know, we used to kind of reference it slightly, uh, as time goes on, I think it can't be overemphasized uh, because it even creeps into the pulpit. And we'll look more at this this afternoon as well concerning our own political situation in American society. Um, we have the continual concern for the present situation. And obviously, uh, there's alignments, there's interests, uh, there's value as we think about policies, as we think about those that are in power to consider from a biblical standpoint. Um, in no way should we just completely avoid it. I mean, we can't avoid it. Uh, but at the same time, there's the temptation to allow it to consume us, and we have that challenge. And obviously, if you, you know, tune on cable news, if you look at your news feed, if you get on social media, we are bombarded continuously with the temptation of being uh, enraptured and entangled with the particulars of our modern day politics and uh, powers that be. And so it is valuable to be reminded and take a step back and reset the stage. Again, it has to be done sometimes, especially uh, every four years and in the, in the current environment where we start getting into election season, uh, sometimes on a regular basis to say, God is in control, everything's going to be okay. And that's not just a flippant statement, that's not just a general phrase. Uh, that has meaning and value. And as we look at the Old Testament, as we look at these prophecies, as we look at what God has done, we see that what is going on today is of little significance and value concerning the primary concern of uh, our eternal souls, which is the church. <laughs> and the church is here. And we see the way in which God has worked we see the way in which these prophets have laid out what God was going to do. We see how God then carried that out. And we are relieved to know it, it's real, it matters, the kingdom is here. 
Uh, we have a king that we serve, Jesus Christ, and everything's going to be okay. And I have comfort. And I am able to be patient. And from what I learned in the Old Testament, I grow in my reverence, I grow in my fear, I grow in my wisdom that all is going to be okay. God is in charge. And everything's going to be all right. And as we look at uh, these prophets in particular, where we are now, we're going in through Isaiah, uh, what Isaiah is doing is on a level, and what these prophets did are on a level that, that is, is at a miraculous, uh, and in a miraculous nature. They are providing uh, God-given dictates and prophecies concerning events that man on his own cannot do, and in an environment where, uh, and in a time even, where uh, information and the capability to do so is, um, is, is fascinating, and it is indeed uh, outside of the laws of nature. It is truly inspiration um, that was delivered. And as we look back on it, um, we are, again, provoked to fear. We're provoked to appreciate and grow in our reverence of God. And so let's just start with, uh, first, where we left off last week, and then we're going to go into Isaiah 7, and then we'll, we'll kind of go through the material. So Isaiah chapter 1, verses 18 through 20, if someone could read that for me. Thinking about the power of God, thinking about who he is, thinking about what he's done, and then we read Isaiah chapter 1, verses 18 through 20, if someone could read that for me. Go now and let us reason together, says the Lord. For your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. For they shall they um, be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If you be willing and obedient, you shall eat good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured with the sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. Okay, and so the invitation here from God, from the creator and sustainer of all the universe, for mankind uh, to be cleansed is um, a picture of his graciousness, of his concern for us. We don't get a seat at the table. We don't deserve, rather, a seat at the table. But yet God has invited us to a seat at the table. Now, we have nothing by which we are able to leverage in terms of our negotiation. Uh, this isn't a negotiation, uh, but God has, benevol uh, in a benevolent fashion, uh, granted us access uh, to him to reason with him and be made right with him, although we are undeserving of it. Uh, you think about what Paul writes to the Romans in Romans chapter 5, starting there in verse Six, for when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly, for scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet for adventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And so when we were in a position of being opposed to God, being enemies against him, having nothing to offer without strength, uh, polluted, disgusting, ugly in his sight, opposed to him, he invites us to the table. He invites us to come reason with him. Uh, we're undeserving of what Isaiah provides here. God's Old Testament nation was undeserving of what God provides here. Uh, mankind is undeserving of what God provides here. It is a picture of his mercy. It is a picture of his love. It is a picture of his uh, willingness and yearning to have us come and be aligned with him, although we have nothing to offer. Um. It's, uh, it's, I think, if we were to think about it from a secular perspective, it, it's, it's, it's truly, uh, truly fascinating. You think about maybe a school situation. Uh, who has authority in a school? 
principle. I want you to imagine a, a child that comes in and that makes and wrecks havoc of that school, does violence in that school, opposes the principal, spits in the face of the principal, uh, curses the principal, uh, is, is completely opposed to any form of academic learning and rejects it outright. And yet the principal says, come, let us reason. Let's reason together. Uh, that's, that's kind of a, an idea as to what it is that God is offering here. All right, let's go into, into Isaiah chapter 7, and uh, let's look here at this context. Uh, this is important. Um, there are several who would oppose this passage, um, and even in the brotherhood, it is uh, something that uh, happens. And so um, let's look here. If someone can read for me, Isaiah chapter 7, uh, verses 10 through 14. Isaiah chapter 7, verses 10 through 14. Okay, uh, and so wh what do we understand this passage to be connected to? The Messianic promise, the fulfillment of the Messianic prophecy. Um, let's go to Matthew chapter 1. Let's start there because it, it's shocking once you read Matthew chapter 1 that anyone would say what I'm about to tell you people say. But let's look at what Matthew writes. And if someone could read for me there, verses 18 through 23. 18 through 23 of Matthew chapter 1. It's been said before that when a New Testament writer says what an Old Testament writer meant, that that's what it meant. In other words, there's no more argument over it. Uh, when Peter described what Joel meant in Joel chapter 2, as we read in Acts chapter 2, then that's what Joel chapter 2 meant. When Matthew writes what Isaiah meant in Matthew chapter 1, then there is no more question as to what Isaiah meant in Isaiah chapter 7. Because an inspired writer commented, declared, dictated, provided the understanding and the meaning of what another inspired writer wrote. However, there are people, religious scholars, okay? There are, again, religious scholars and those even in the Brotherhood, uh, who will say, that Isaiah did not mean what Matthew says Isaiah meant. And that it's not possible that Isaiah could have even meant what Matthew said Isaiah meant. And the reason is odd. Uh, it boils down to their explanation. Ahaz wouldn't have understood what was going on in terms of what would take place in the future. Why would uh, this type of declaration be made to Ahaz 
given that it is completely detached from him in his current context. And because of the lack of understanding and because of the lack of application in that current context, therefore it couldn't have meant what Matthew said it meant. Okay? Again, this is what scholars, this is what those even in our own brotherhood, by the way, will say. All right? Uh, let's start with that thought by going over to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. And if someone could read for me there verses 10 through 12, let's just start off here with, with again, those thoughts that people will claim in mind. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 10 through 12. Of which salvation the prophets have required the church diligently to prophesy in the, of the grace that should come unto you. First you what, or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them would signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. Unto whom it was revealed, and not unto themselves, but unto us who did minister the things which were which are now reported unto you for them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. Okay. And so in this context, here's the question. Did the prophets necessarily understand the way in which what they were prophesying about would be fulfilled? Even though they were prophesying of it, did they understand how it was going to happen? No. Peter tells us that. They themselves were trying to understand and search diligently how it is that God is going to bring about the gospel. How is it possible that this is going to happen? Even though they themselves are the ones prophesying about it. Likewise, it's not just the prophets. Who else are also included in terms of looking into, trying to understand, how is God going to bring this about? The angels. Okay? So, for our brethren and for critics to say that there's no way Isaiah chapter 7 could be applied to Matthew chapter 1. There's no way that Ahaz being told what he was told could have been a reference to the Messiah because there would have been a lack of understanding. There's no way because of the, of the current context just conceptually completely misses what we find in the scripture regarding how prophecy worked. They did not fully understand. We know that. And so to, to demand that it must fit in that context and it must be fully understood in that present time as it was being prophesied ignores what other scripture teaches us concerning prophecy. And so that's point one. But point two, let's notice some things about this prophecy. Uh, and again, the passion here, by the way, is really a matter of concern because to reject what we find here rejects a core tenet concerning the value and fascination of prophecy, what Isaiah has laid out here for us. It rejects a core tenet regarding how it is that the Messiah would come about. It rejects the fascination of God providing knowledge concerning the birth of Christ and how he would fulfill his promises. We can't just reject this and then just kind of like shove it off to the side and say, oh, well, it's no big deal if that's rejected. Uh, no, that's a huge deal. Because now you've called into question the validity of the New Testament because the New Testament declares Isaiah meant this in Isaiah chapter 7. So, so now... What are we studying here? Why are we studying this book if we're saying then that Isaiah 7 didn't mean what Matthew said Isaiah 7 meant? So you can't just throw that out there and then just shrug your shoulders and say it's no big deal and then likewise claim to be a scholar and an authority figure. That's a problem. Okay? But we have people that do this. Prominent people. Right? Okay? Let's look at Isaiah 7. Let's look at the context. What is it that Ahaz was told? 
The Lord spake again unto Ahaz. Verse 10. Okay, so Ahaz is being addressed. We get that. Let's look at what then goes on concerning what's declared. Ahaz and the Lord go back and forth, 11 and 12. And so it's declared to Ahaz in verse 13. Hear ye now, O house of David. Now, Ahaz is being addressed. But who is being addressed concerning this prophecy? It's no longer just Ahaz. Who is God declaring this unto? The house of David. That's important. Let's go to Matthew chapter 1 again. Matthew chapter 1. And let's look at the context of what we find here in Matthew chapter 1. Again, to shrug this off, violates scripture, disrespects the fascination of prophecy and the specificity of it, and also, you then become blinded to how God puts all these pieces together for us regarding his love for mankind in laying out for us how all the dots connect. Look at the beauty here of what we find in Matthew chapter 1. Starting there in verse 1. The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David. I have one reference to David. Verse 6. And Jesse begat David the king. I have another reference to David. And David begat, and David the king begat Solomon. I have another reference to David. Drop down now to verse 17. So all the generations from Abraham to David, another reference, are 14 generations. And from David until the carrying away of Babylon, David, another reference, are 14 generations. And from the carrying away unto Babylon unto Christ are 14 generations. All right? Uh, let's continue on. Notice then, looking at verse 20. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David. Fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. Another reference to David. Uh, let's then look also. Uh, that may be it. So we have six references clearly called out in the first chapter here addressing the prophecy concerning Christ and his arrival continuously circling back to David. Now, why does that matter? Uh, let's again go throughout Scripture and take a note of a few other passages. Let's start at 2 Samuel chapter 7. 2 Samuel chapter 7. And let's look here starting in verse 12. If someone can read for me verses 12 through 13. 12 through 13 of 2 Samuel chapter 7. And when thy days be fulfilled, for thou shalt sleep with thy father. I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. All right, and so uh, David's kingdom and his house of what he was interested in doing, he was interested in building a physical temple, is of not primary eternal concern for the Lord. What is a primary concern? The church. Uh, the church would be built from David's offspring. And the Messiah would come through the seed of David. So from the house of David. And so as Ahaz is being addressed in Isaiah chapter 7, uh, God turns from addressing Ahaz specifically to then addressing the house of Ahaz, the house of David, more generally. And the declaration and the prophecy is not directed toward Ahaz. It is directed toward, more holistically, the house of David. You see there then, obviously, uh, verse 13 and then verse 14. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. And so, um, with all of those points in mind, uh, three primary points. One, when a New Testament writer declares the interpretation and the meaning of, 
of an Old Testament prophecy, that New Testament writer being inspired, has then decreed what the meaning of the Old Testament inspired writer meant, and that's what it meant. That settles it, so that's one. Two, to challenge Isaiah chapter 7 because Ahaz would not have fully understood and the context uh, was not fully dealing with what it was that was declared unto him means that it couldn't have been referencing uh, the prophecy regarding the birth of Christ ignores the rest of Scripture, which provides for us the understanding that the prophets sometimes did not fully understand what it was they were writing concerning how God would fulfill his prophecies. And three, in the context, if you look at what was declared unto Ahaz, the prophecy is not directed toward Ahaz. It is directed toward the house of David regarding the birth of the Messiah. And as you look at Matthew chapter 1 and the emphasis on the house of David in Matthew chapter 1, you see there God connecting the dots, tying it all together for us. Again, remember what Matthew uh, was, who he was writing. Who was his audience? It was a Jewish audience. He's laying out, this is he. This is the Messiah. This is who you have been waiting on. Uh, Emmanuel, God with us. And so, uh, that, that's, that's, again, an important aspect. And again, this is 700 years prior, uh, nearly. 600, 700 years prior to the birth of Christ that Isaiah is laying this out. Uh, and so that's, uh, that's Isaiah chapter 7. Any, any comments there on Isaiah 7? Thoughts? Well, one thing is, yeah. the people that argue that, yeah. is, um, Basically, refusing to see that as a prophecy. Yeah. So they may pick and choose other prophecies. Oh, yeah. So who, who are they to decide what's yeah. a prophecy and what is not based on yes. you know, their knowledge? But, uh, it, I mean, when I read it, I automatically think of Jesus being born. Right. Because we, are, we have the history in our hands now. We know right. what happened. Right. Uh, but yeah, like today, uh, the end of the world coming. fully understood every piece of what was declared and, and they didn't need to, as Peter explains. They, they were searching, they were seeking. Uh, it, it, think about again what God has done. You have Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, that in the seed of Abraham, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. How is it that God is going to do this? I mean, it, we're spoiled because we see the end of the story. We know how that works. But they would not have been able to wrap their minds around how such would have been possible. And so their understanding would have been challenged because they didn't have the whole picture. Uh, but yet we do. And so you're absolutely right as well. To, to challenge this prophecy, to challenge then Isaiah 7, to challenge Matthew 1, to challenge you know, the, the connection there, is not just to challenge that one prophecy. Who then are you to say which prophecies are correct? Who then are you to say, well, this is actually prophecy, and this is actually from God, and then, well, this isn't, and that, that didn't mean... No, you, you can't do that. Uh, but that's really what gives academics a job, is to say they're the ones that know, you know how to decide that for us. Uh, any other comments or thoughts? Correct. Yeah. Yeah, you've overeducated your intelligence, absolutely. Well, and a lot of it, it is pride. It boils down to, as brethren will do, uh, there's Hebrew Union College, there's there's other uh, institutions that will provide biblical instruction and, and degrees, but they're heavily rooted in Old Testament 
study. Yeah, well, yep, yeah, no, you're right. The purpose from that particular institution where the degrees are then given out is to uh, protect the Jewish tradition and reject the uh, Messianic and the New Testament completely. But then as our brethren and as others then get influenced by that, uh, you know, they're trying to walk a fine line and they end up compromising. And you're right, it, it purpose isn't for God's glory. Ultimately, it, it boils down to, to self-glory, fortunately. Uh, yes? Mm -hmm. Yeah, correct. Yeah. Amen. Amen. And, and again, to write this in terms of this is absolutely what it meant because we see it in Scripture allows us to then think along those lines, which is even then more fascinating concerning everything that's taking place. In their minds, how in the world is God going to deliver on his promises? How in the world is the promise that was initially given to Abraham ever going to come about? We are in jeopardy in our own lives. We have Assyrian captivity. We have destruction of the northern kingdom from Assyria. We have Babylonian captivity. We have our own nation and survival being in jeopardy. Well, God, you must not love us anymore. You must not, you're, you're not going to do what you said you were going to do. But yet all the while, God is laying out his plan, planting seeds. He knows all. He's going to deliver on it. And even in their punishment, even in their dispersion, their being carried away, all the challenges that they went through, in their own minds, they're thinking it's all over. All the while, God has a remnant, and God knows exactly what's, what's going to happen. And again, that provokes us to reverence, that provokes us to wisdom and fear and appreciation and comfort that God delivers on his promises. So the next time I question concerning God's plan for salvation and my eternal destiny being heaven, and I then reflect upon what's taken place throughout the history of time, even though it may seem like it's never going to happen, God always delivers on his promises. It's going to happen. Uh, any other comments or questions? Yeah, uh, it's so easy. Uh, it seems to be easy to deviate from the Bible teaching. I grew up in a little area over in Louisiana, and a lot of friends came to church there for years and years. And we come to this church and find them for them. And uh, I got a uh, message or a text or somebody over there. And, and there's a congregation in one of Louisiana that's pretty directing God or God in the Bible. They use the term Yahweh. That term was used back in Why would they want to change? I mean, what in their mind is the reason they would change? You said the son of this boy is strong church in the Lord's name. But what else are we going to try to go back to? The timeline, if we think about the timeline in the Bible, what God said back in the Old Testament is not going to happen. The New Testament Amen. came along. Amen. One reason is nobody understood what they were talking about back in the Old Testament. And then all of a sudden, when this comes forward, just like the birth of Christ, when this comes forward, that makes all of the Old Testament make more sense, for lack of a better way, more sense. Yes, right. Amen. Amen, brother. And regarding the Yahweh uh, comment, <clears throat> You know, that's right in line with what's happened throughout history as well, where various groups will attempt to overly bind and claim that by approaching things the way they're approaching them, they are more pure. And you have this with the, with the Catholic religion. You have this, again, there's other instances uh, where folks have claimed, well, you're not truly reading God's Word unless you're reading it in the original Greek or unless you're reading it in the original Hebrew or Aramaic, etc., 
uh, and, and we have no justification for that. As a matter of fact, because that's the thought process, um, and that's probably why Yahweh is the term that they're using. But in that very thought, by the way, um, the scripture rejects this for us, because uh, sometimes people will struggle with that, and they'll say, well, wait a second, um, how is it that us reading a translation, us not reading the original, us not doing things exactly as it was, as it was de delivered, how is it that that is still valid? Uh, because the language is different, and a translation has occurred, and I want you to look at this, because this is the answer to it. Uh, Luke chapter 4, verse 16, and he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering uh, the sight of the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. That's Isaiah, uh, I believe it's chapter 61, verses 1 through 2. Just go there real quick. Isaiah chapter 1, Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 through 2. Uh, yes, and so if you read that there, you see then the translation of the Hebrew to the English, in Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 through 2, then you read what's written here by Luke, and there's some variation here. Why is that the case? Well, because what Jesus is reading and what Luke provides us is a translation into the Greek. So Isaiah would have been translated into Greek, and you call that the Septuagint or the LXX, and so what Jesus is reading here is a translation. And notice here, uh, what Jesus then goes on to say, verse 21, this day is the scripture fulfilled in your ears. So what does Jesus provide us there? That translations are valid. Translations are considered scripture. Uh, and so to say we must address God as Yahweh or, again, other religion, well, we have to it's even more confusing, because then you start looking at some of the things they've required. It must be spoken in Latin, which doesn't make any sense at all. Uh, but some have said, well, it must be read in Greek or the original Hebrew. No. That's just an attempt, once again, to try to elevate and claim by overbinding things. One is then achieving a higher level of purity uh, or um, a higher level of spirituality. Uh, when that's not uh, authorized in the scripture at all. Thank you all very much for the class and the comments.